Father God, we just thank you for the words that you have given Jeanette to bring to us today. We know that you have been speaking to us already in this service. And we just pray that you might speak further to us, that you will use the words that you have given Jeanette to speak into our hearts. That you will change us and bring us closer to you. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> I speak in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I've, got a bit, I've been singing too loudly. <laughs> I've got a bit croaky. As I was uh, reading through today's passage in a Lectio Divina sort of way, I was struck by the phrase, what are you doing? 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all in the, for the glory of God. Why do you do what you do? Is it for your own status or for the glory of God? I used to be a systems analyst. I designed and wrote software for various manufacturing companies in the Midlands. I loved my job because I was helping to make people's roles easier to manage. I would analyze the current system by interviewing people from the shop floor to the top management. And then I would look at how we could do it better and more efficiently. It was great for about 15 years. And I gained a reputation for being good at it and was even headhunted a couple of times. But one day, while I was interviewing someone about their role, they said, you're like the flipping Gestapo, asking so many questions. Are you going to get rid of me? He didn't say flipping. <laughs> I was brought up a bit short. I felt awful. I knew that the new system would probably make his role very precarious. And the crunch came when my boss asked me to design a new purchasing system which would make three people redundant. My eyes were suddenly opened wide to what I was doing. I was actually making people redundant, not helping them. And it, and it really didn't fit comfortably with me and it wasn't honouring to God. I wanted to help people, not make life more difficult for them. And that's when I made the decision that I could no longer do the job I loved. It was well paid, I was well respected, I was good at it. But it was no longer what I should be doing. I took a job with Birmingham City Mission, doing desktop publishing. I'd never done it before, but I thought it's design, I can, I'm sure I can work it out. It was designing in a different way. I didn't even earn enough to pay tax but it was working for something I believed in. And I was giving rather than taking. Some of the things that Jesus does in today's passage might cause us to ask, what are you doing? I think there are three different occasions when we might ask, what are you doing? Firstly, when someone is doing something which looks wrong, what are you doing? When we don't understand what someone's doing, what are you doing? And then when we want to know how to do what someone is doing, what are you doing? Show me. So let's first set the scene. The disciples and Jesus have come from Jericho towards Jerusalem. It's only about 12 miles as the crow flies, but it's a big climb from 800 feet below sea level to 3,000 feet above sea level. Their journey to the Mount of Olives would have taken them through a hot, dry desert, and it was uphill. And now they stand, gazing over Jerusalem below them. Now, we know that it's dangerous for Jesus to go to Jerusalem. They want to kill him. So why is he going there? What are you doing? Luke 9, 51 tells us, as the time approached for him to be taken to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. He knew what was facing him, but he still went. 
And he's mentioned it to his disciples endless times. Back in Mark 10, he says, Listen, we're going up to Jerusalem where the Son of Man will be betrayed to the leading priests and teachers of the religious law. They will sentence him to die and hand him over to the Romans. They will mock him, spit on him, flog him with a whip and kill him. But after three days, he will rise again. Jesus was determined to fulfill God's plan of saving humankind, no matter what it cost. He was determined to go to the cross for each one of us. He was determined to do what he came for, whatever the cost. Jesus and his disciples are not the only ones coming to Jerusalem. It's the time of Passover, the time when the Jews remembered their freedom from slavery in Egypt. Jews from all over the Roman world would have been making their way to celebrate the feast in Jerusalem. There would have been a real carnival atmosphere as they trekked up the hill and then down again. And the follower of Jesus would have been even more excited as they know that this is the time for Jesus to reveal himself as the long-awaited Messiah, the conquering hero, the one who's going to rescue them. So there's a real buzz as the crowds make their way towards the city. Then Jesus asks two of his disciples to go and get a donkey. Not a war horse, not even a mature donkey, but the colt of a donkey. I wonder if the disciples thought, why are we doing this? Can't we do something with a bit more kudos? They probably had no idea how significant this donkey was in the plan of God. This was a prophetic assignment with huge implications. Back in Zechariah 9, the Bible says, Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. Some of us don't like doing little tasks, do we? We want big tasks. We want some to do something which looks great. But what are we doing? Who are we doing it for? It's far better to do something which doesn't look significant. There's less chance of falling flat on your face. Things like blessing someone with a gift. Encouraging someone, making a phone call, dropping in to see someone, making a financial gift, providing a meal for someone. All of those can be a God moment for the, for the recipient. It might feel like a donkey moment, but in God's plans, it could be significant. So obeying Jesus, the disciples go to the village and find the donkey. Some people standing there don't like it. Oi, what do you think you're doing? They cry. The disciples calmly reply, the master needs it. And the word for master here is curios, which can also mean supreme ruler. Maybe that's why they let the disciples take the donkey. It doesn't really matter if it was all prearranged by Jesus or not. That's not not the case. The fact is that Jesus was in control. These events remind us that Jesus is God and he is in control of all things. Isaiah 46, 11 says, God says, what I have said, that I will bring about. What I have planned, that I will do. You can trust him, you can rely on him, and you can depend on him. I find it quite interesting that the disciples are challenged by bystanders, not even the owner. I often, how often, I wonder, are we sticking our oar in when it's none of our business? A number of times people come to me to complain about someone else or what someone else is doing. Unless someone else, unless what someone else is doing is hurting or has the potential to hurt someone else, I'm not interested. Jesus said, do not judge or you too will be judged. 
For in the same way as you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So the disciples did exactly what Jesus told them, and all was well. And I love the fact that we don't know which disciples they were. It doesn't matter who does what, as long as the Lord is glorified. It's about Jesus, not us. If you don't get the recognition for what you do, God knows. He recognizes what you've done, and he's the one that matters. If people forget your name, don't be offended. You want people to remember Jesus, not you. He must increase and I must decrease. Keep doing what you're doing, whether anybody says thank you or not. Be concerned about being faithful, not about the opinion of others. Now, it's one thing to be taking a baby donkey along on a journey, but it's another actually riding it. It's not exactly what Jesus' followers expected of him. It's dangerous for him to come to Jerusalem in the first place. And now he's making a fool of himself on a baby donkey. I'm sure they asked, what are you doing? It's not even been broken in yet. It'll toss you off. They didn't understand why he was doing what he was doing. But this is Jesus we're talking about. The creator of all things. The creator of that donkey. Of course he'll be able to control an unbroken donkey. And a prophecy has to be fulfilled. When John talks about the triumphal entry of Jesus, he says, his disciples didn't understand at the time that this was a fulfillment of the prophecy. But after Jesus entered into his glory, they remembered what had happened and realized that these things had been written about him. The disciples don't understand everything behind what Jesus asks, but they do it. Anyway, and God often asks us to do things that we may not understand. He also does things that we don't understand. It didn't make sense for Paul and I at the time to move down south, but it was right. It didn't, I didn't understand why God wouldn't allow us to have children, but it's right now. It's not so much about understanding, it's about obeying. It's about being faithful and trusting him. God will not waste any experience in this life. He will use it for his glory later, if you trust him. In the recovery course on Wednesday, we were saying that the witness of someone who has been through addiction and then transformed by Jesus is such a powerful witness to those in addiction. So whatever has happened to you in your life, it's a powerful witness to someone else, the way you got through it with God. So Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey's colt, just as God had planned. Jesus is coming as the king, as the prince of peace. And that's why he's on a donkey, not a horse. And it's a young animal because it represents purity and holiness to the Jews. And Jesus is all of that. He's humble, he's a man of peace, he's pure and he's holy. Jesus is coming into his kingdom. And that is just how the people react to him. The fact that they lay down their cloaks and they wave branches shows that that they see him as king. They wouldn't have done that for anybody else. They, They would only do it for royalty, not even their family or friends. Just royalty. And they shout, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Hosanna is a Hebrew word which is a bit of a cross between praise and prayer. It's exuberant praise to God, but it's also a prayer that God will save his people. It's an appeal to God for deliverance. Lord, save us! They're shouting. It's interesting to note that Jesus is willing to do this at all. Throughout the Gospel of Mark, 
Jesus has told numerous people to not tell anyone what he's done for them. Jesus wanted no public praises or announcements. But today, it's different. Jesus is setting in motion the next phase of the kingdom of God. So he opens the gates for his followers to publicly declare his praises. Once Jesus enters Jerusalem, there is no turning back. Nothing is going to make him abandon his mission mission of saving people like you and me. And when he gets to Jerusalem and the excitement dies down, Jesus goes straight to the temple. In effect, he's saying the presence of God is returning to the temple. But in Mark's version of events, he goes through the temple gates, he looks around, and then he goes back to Bethany. It's a bit of an anticlimax. What was he doing? Maybe it's as simple as he needed to get the donkey back. Mark tells us that he was going to return it. Maybe it's too late to start upsetting the um, stall holders. That can wait for tomorrow. Or maybe after the long rest, long hard day, he just needs a rest. He knows that this week is going to be really tough. And he needs time with God to prepare himself. As I said last week, we need to work out of a place of rest and not see rest as a reward for work. Whatever the reason that Jesus went back to Bethany, it was part of God's plan. The last way of asking what he's doing is not so obvious in this passage, but it is there. Jesus spent his whole life asking his father, what are you doing? And he did what he saw the father doing. He looked to the father to know what to do. John 5, 19, Jesus tells his um, disciples, Very truly I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can, only, he can do only what he sees his father doing. Because whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Yes, and he will show him even greater works than these, so that you will be amazed. The greatest work is about to be accomplished on the cross. Jesus acts under submission to God the Father. He does exactly what he sees the Father doing. He is a channel of the power of God. Now, of course, Jesus has the power to do things apart from God. We all do. But he chooses never to exercise that power for his own benefit. We saw him doing that during his 40 days in the desert after his baptism. The devil was unable to tempt him to do anything for his own benefit. Jesus always looks to the Father to seek the Father's heart. And we too are called to join in with what the Father is doing. Daily we need to ask God, what are you doing today? And how can I join in? How often do we do it the other way around? Here's my plan, Lord. Will you bless it? I think that the bus stop cafe is exceeding our expectations because it was so clearly God's idea and not ours. That's what I mean by joining in with what God is doing. It was clear in this story where the two disciples were to go and it was clear what they were to do. And I love it that two couples in this church have been so excited about what God is doing in Crookhorn that they've either moved here or they're about to move here to be a closer part of it. One of them knew that God was calling them to go to Nineveh. And their spirit told them that Nineveh is Crookhorn. That is listening to the Father's heart. And it's putting aside personal preferences for the glory of God. 
Each of us is a representative of Jesus. Our role is to be faithful, to get involved and to do our part, to seek him constantly so that we know what he wants us to say and do. He will provide what we need, the gifts, the energy, the time. Everything we have belongs to God anyway. We're just custodians of it. So everything we have should be available for his use. Everything we have is a donkey, we can be u- that, which can be used for God's glory. It might be, <laughs> that doesn't mean your wife. <laughs> I, I heard that. So, so it might, your donkey might be a skill or money or time or a resource. What are you doing with what God has given you? Jesus said in Luke 9, 23, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. God is in charge. And each day he has something important for you to do. You may not recognize the importance. It may feel like a donkey assignment. You may not fully understand what he asks of you. But God is sovereign and in control. He made you and he knows what you need to do. So what are you doing? Are you doing anything which is not God's idea? Are you doing something that you know to be wrong in God's eyes? Are you doing something because you get the glory? And what are we doing as a church? Are we doing anything that's not God's idea? Is there anything we need to be stopping? Are, there, are we doing something that we know to be wrong in God's eyes? And are we doing something so that Cogs gets the glory and not God? But we must remember, I've talked a lot about doing. All of this doing must come out of a place of being. Remember Martha and Mary. Martha busied herself in the kitchen, getting more and more steamed up while Mary sat and listened to Jesus. And when Martha complained, Jesus told her, Mary has chosen what is better. We need to spend time with God in order to know his heart, in order to know what to do. Doing must come out of a place of being. So what are you doing? Would you like to stand?